This episode of Broken Bones and Bullshit is sponsored by Ozcan Rule. Next guest is Peter Blackhall. Welcome on the show, mate. Thanks for having me, mate. <laughs> so take us uh, way back to the start. How did uh, the whole rodeo career start for yourself? Oh, it started probably 40 years ago. Um, just through juniors, potty went to a rodeo, hopped on a potty and got the bug and <laughs> started from there. I think I was 12. Um, went through an era there just riding up until about juniors and... Um, we used to go down to uh, the late great Campbell Frames every Wednesday to practice. So um, when there's just a bunch of the boys, you'd sort of had to step around a few, and that's where I found my niche in the sport. Oh, and that's when the whole bullfighting started. Yeah, pretty much, mate. Mm -hmm. um, I say I did my apprenticeship at Campbell, so I probably spent four years in the practice pen before I actually got a show and. The first show was Mo uh, Mooney Pro Rodeo. Uh, just turned up there with me travelling mates, and they were all bull riders. And uh, the rodeo clown never turned up. And <laughs> Billy Johnson actually said to uh, Happy Gill, he said, uh, "I got a bloke here that'll fight him for you if you want." And there was no bullfighter there, so that was sort of the start of it then. Yeah, wow. Well. And um, back in the prime, the likes of Bambi and True Grit and. I didn't really know them bulls. So <laughs> you would have learned them pretty quick. Oh, yeah, my word, though. Yeah, you know, um, back in the year of the PS brand sort of gave it away and <laughs> you had to make sure you're on your toes all the time. So <laughs> The yeah. old Pat Speedy. Yep, yep. <laughs> there was nothing like them, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> they were everywhere. Yeah. And then from there, I just, yeah, started sort of fighting bulls and went through the amateur circuit. Um, slowly progressed and did my time like everyone does and until you sort of get to the pinnacle of the sport and um, yeah 16 years of fighting bulls and then I sort of retired and uh, sort of just kept active in the sport in other capacities so yeah whether it was judging or promoting or yeah speaking of that you had a lot to do with the CBR when that started yeah, back in the era, mate. Um, Troy came home uh, not long after he won the world and had an idea that we could do the same here. And uh, we had a meeting down in Mudgee and, and uh, knowing Troy pretty well, um, I got invited into that meeting. There was eight of us. And we actually only pooled $9,000 um, <laughs> out of that, and that was the start of it. And Within a four-year period, we sort of had television involved and uh, contracts on the table for a million and a half bucks. So wow. it uh, progressed pretty quick, um, but uh, it was just bringing everyone together. Everyone sort of had the same vision of what they wanted in the sport. It was just a matter of someone putting it together, and that was the right time and place, and, mm. and then it just progressed from there. And it was the first time in Australia that really the good guys from all the associations actually got pulled in 100%, together yeah mm. um very fortunate that uh everyone wanted to be a part of it so there was yeah the nra champions the pro champions the bushy champions anyone who was anyone in the sport of bull riding mm. came along and and uh you know we used to have 45 spots and mm. And uh, it was an era where any one of those 45 blokes could generally jump out and win the win event. The, win the event. Mm. You know, it was just a great era of calibre of bull riders. And it was so tough back then that if you went two or three weeks without riding one, you'd get dropped. Yeah. And then you guy would get... For sure, mate. So we had a process there where you, you had to keep riding them to stay in it mm. because there was that many blokes knocking at the door. Um, I can remember Bow Desert one year, um, we had 80 entries and uh, we only took 45. Yeah, wow. Um, blokes had travelled from one end of the country just to be an alternate on the hope that they'd get in. Yeah, wow. And, and that's how some blokes started and then you just had to stay, get them riding. Stay sticking on them, yep. yeah. You know, you had to be consistent in riding them and, and um, you know, that's the name of the game, be there for the eight second whistle. And a lot of people speak on that. That was like the glory years of Australian bull riding. Like there was, like you think of the names, they're still big names today. Like you got your Jack Woodles, your Brandies. 100%, yeah. mate. Yeah, like a lot of them blokes, uh, you know, like you said, Jack, Brandy, um, Brad Scotts, you know, Scott Fraser, 
Troy came home for a while and rode at him. Um, you know, pretty much anyone that was anyone in the sport yeah. came along. Um, you know, young Jace Hearn, uh, Hearn rode there and, and won a title. Um, you know, Ben Jones, they all rode. <laughs> yeah, the list goes on, eh? The list goes on, mate, mm. yeah. And what were some, some of the standout balls in the CBA era? Oh, to me, and I've been asked this question a few times, you know, what would be your top five bulls that you've seen throughout your career? And, and um, you know, probably three out of them would have been from that era. Um, earthquake, Insanity, and probably Cotton Eye Joe. Yeah. Um, and who was on that? I know Insanity Earthquake was, was Peter Gills. Um, Akuba Insanity was Happy's. And then Cotton Eye Joe was Johnson Brothers. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then bulls that hold their own in a short round pen today. Mm. Um, earthquake, in my opinion. Uh, Troy rode him at Brisbane there, probably one of the rankest bull rides I've seen. <laughs> um, especially, you know, he never got rode. Yeah. Um, we had the Americans come over to Townsville one year. Terry Don West got on him. And Terry was in the peak of his career. And <laughs> I threw him off. Threw him off. Yeah, yeah. wow. And um, so, yeah, just a big bull and mm. athletic. Because that would have been around um, the stage when the first time Guillermo Machi come over. Yeah, a lot of them fellas. There was an era there where every uh, every year at Townsville they'd bring over internationals. Um, yeah, you know, Robson, Palermo, Silvano, um, you know, back in the early piece was tough. JW, um, Ty came over to Sydney one year. So, yeah, you got to meet all them fellas. Michael Gaffney, great bloke Michael Gaffney. Um, so, yeah, it was great to have them sort of international fellas come across. They did well um, competing on our bulls, but uh, our bulls certainly showed mm. them that they were a calibre just yeah. as good as in the States. And Glamoury reckons, he goes, the first trip he come over, the bulls reminded him of the bulls back home for him. Yes. Like yep. they're Brazil, like they're all just... No, big, big bucking bulls. Yeah. Like we're in, in America, we're starting to catch up to America now where we're breeding and they're starting to get smaller. And I think that's a little bit of the American influence mm. from um, all the genetics. I mean, you know, the ABBI and, and the genetics now, you know, involved in the sport. It's sort of, um, you know, they don't have to be a big bull to be a rank bull. Mm. And, um, you know, so obviously we're influenced from that genetics so you know we breed them but you know I think nutrition and and just where them bulls are bred you know the country they're on you know um, you look at you know current fellas like Sir Jason Dittman you know like they're all big stout bulls <laughs> yeah. and rank bulls you know they're on a feeding regime and mm. and you know so the, the, the sport on an overall basis has sort of professionalized itself mm. right through the ranks you know yeah. right from stock nutrition mm. to the breeding, you know, and uh, and obviously the bull riders. Because, mm. yeah, the feeding regime, regime for the bulls, it's no different to a racehorse. But like the, yeah. the quality of yeah. feed that we're sticking into these animals, and you just need to go to an event and look at everything. Yeah. Everything's shining, everything's athletes, looking good. Yeah. Like, you, especially some of the years, you go back a couple of years in Victoria when we had the drought, you wouldn't know a drought was on if yeah. you went to a rodeo because all the bulls look smick. Yeah. And I think that's just stock contractors, you know, mm. that's their pride and joy, yeah. mate. You know, uh, I've had the privilege of carting bulls down the road myself to PBRs and, and you know, you want the best out of your animals. So, mm. you know, you look after them. And, and again, you know, that's just the professionalism that, mm. that's, you know, in the sport now that... Yeah. If you want the best, well, you've got to look after it. And, you know, that goes for the bull riders mm. themselves. You know, if you want to be the best, you've got to look after yourself. Mm. Yeah, it's the same with us. If we're athletes, you're not going to eat McDonald's and think you're going to perform at your highest. Like, That's right, yeah. And it's the same with these bulls. We want to keep getting the best feed into them, make sure they're feeling good, because if they're feeling good, they're going to do a better job. Yeah, mm. 100%, mate. And... Uh, you know, genetics play a big part in it now. Mm. Um, when I first started uh, in my career, you know, there was, we used to go and catch a lot of clean skin cattle and, <laughs> and buck them, you know, so, whereas now it's all bred, you know, and we're getting into, you know, four and five generations of breeding here in Australia and, 
and that influence from America, so top genetics are coming over and, you know, we've seen that with bulls the likes of Hillbilly mm. Deluxe and, you know, the list can go on now. Um, and, you know, it's, in my opinion, I, you know, the, the bulls aren't that much better nowadays. There's just more of them and that's going to yeah. continue. There's going to mm. be more of those better bulls because of the genetics. It just minimises percentages of... Mm of having a bad <laughs> one to having a rank one mm. so and nowadays i feel it's a lot different with a lot of the big contractors are open to be selling their genetics where back in the day a lot of people kept it pretty tight they did like, yes they, yeah. they didn't want to sell off like a good cow or a good thing yeah. they'd rather get rid of it and then then because they're trying to keep theirs the strongest now everybody's pretty open like you can you can buy one of the top bred cows in the country if you've got enough money, yep. and then and then stick a good straw in it, and then you've you've skipped thirty years. That's right. Mm. Yeah, for anyone coming into the industry now, yeah, it's it's um, the best time to start. It, yeah, it is my mm. word. So exactly that, you know, and the proofs in the pudding after you know the Peter Wallace's sale, um, mm. you know his dispersal sale, um, you know exceptional sale, and that just sort of showed where the sports at with mm. the breeding side of things that people are prepared to pay. The dollars to get that mm. good bread and um, you know hopefully produce something that down the track is is going to make it to that elite yeah. level because instead of like back in the day you just try to get the care if you get one bread or not and then put a buck and ball like it takes you 15 years till you're starting to get something yeah. that's actually get something doing, on the ground that yeah that, that is worthy but of now it. you can just skip all that and yeah. then go and see someone and then get a well-bred heifer. Yeah. And then and then you're off and racing. Like. Yeah, and it's, you know, AIing, uh, embryo transfers. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, like you said, it skips 30 years. Yeah. Well, you know, some of it now, particularly with the influence in the States, you know, like there's 40, 50 years of breeding behind mm. some of them bulls. So, you know... Um, and I think that'll continue, mm. uh, you know, within the industry. There's a lot of people out there trying to create incentives for, mm. for breeding and, and breeder incentives. And and then, you know, you've got the likes of the uh, ABBI and, and the BBA with these uh, dummy events. Mm. So, you know, it's given an opportunity to sort of screen them bulls at a younger age. So mm. when they do get to that rider stage, you know exactly what you've got and... Mm. And, you know, they're pretty patterned by that stage, especially if they go through that dummy period. Um, and it's know. a good good outlet for a fella that's really interested and wants to start and you can just have a small herd. Yes. You don't have to worry about growing it into a four-year-old and taking it to a rodeo. Yeah. You can get a, like, have a couple of cows, get a couple of bulls to fiddle with and take them to, sh take them to these BBAs or ABBIs yeah. and then just fiddle around with it once they get big then you can move them on if you don't have shows to do and I think that'll uh, that'll eventually uh, happen where there'll be sales mm. for that those sorts of things and which will entice more people to get into it um, you know it's it's gonna progress the bulls uh, immensely I think over probably the next five years um, you know we sort of say that you know they're pretty ranked now but I think we'll you know, I think we'll see better bulls in the mm. future. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just hope that we see better cowboys too. Mm. So, you know, and, and that'll come through with a lot more schools and, and uh, you know, just teaching them the right way. And, and you've seen a lot of kids now, you know, or the young men, but, I mean, I, I still call them kids because I've seen them <coughs> since they were yeah, this, this big, big, you know, the likes of your Kai Hamiltons, your... Quinn Andersons, you know, young Jacob Carriage, um, you know, they're all young fellas kicking goals mm. in the States now and um, mainly because of their dedication and commitment mm. and, you know, that's something I think that needs to be instilled into these young cowboys now is, you know, you've got to dedicate and commit yourself to this sport, mm. 110%, you know, because we've all seen it, it's, um, you know, it's a pretty dangerous sport. Mm. You know, I've got a few mates in wheelchairs, um, you know, unfortunate, but that's that's the game, that's the game yeah. we play. Like when I had J.W. Hart on here, like he went to Lane's funeral and he yep. told a story how 
you seen one fella grabbing his gear bag out of his car and then taking to the next car because they're heading straight to a rodeo from the funeral. Yeah. And he goes, it just that's the game. Yeah. Like you don't want it to happen and no one wishes for it, but and he goes, that never wavered what he wanted to be. He's like, he knew what the rules are and this is yep. how dangerous yeah, it can be. Involved with yeah. It. And, and, you know, progression throughout the sport. We've now seen vests. Like when I first started, there was no vests and helmets. Um, so, you know, we've seen that progression through and, and particularly the helmet, you know, like now if you're born after a certain year, you yeah, know, it's mandatory, 96, I think. mandatory mm. to wear a helmet. I just think most young fellas now should be wearing them mm. regardless because, you know, um, it's just going to prolong your bull riding mm. career. So, you know, and, and if that's what you want to be, well, you'll do whatever it takes. Mm. And so. there's sometimes they get pulled down and get hit on that cage and just rattles them a little bit, but it's not a trip to the hospital. They're yeah. not missing teeth. And that's not, right. Not full facial yeah. reconstructions, mm. and which I've seen all of that, unfortunately. Like I said, when we first sort of throughout my career, there wasn't later in my career sort of the vest and helmet came in um, and the more protection gear. So, you know, but, yeah, I've seen some pretty gnarly wrecks. <laughs> so, um, Have you been involved in any of them? Yeah, mate, unfortunately <laughs> fighting bulls for 16 years, you, you, you cop them, but my saying is you play with the horns, be prepared for the hookins. <laughs> so, you know, that's, again, part and parcel of it. How good you come back from them wrecks mm. determines the sort of person yeah. you are in the sport. Um, probably the worst one I had, I had a bull pride of vests, I had a bull get me down and jump on my chest and popped all my ribs off my sternum backbone. Um, that laid me up for a good while. <laughs> um, probably the most pain because there's not a lot they can really do for it. But yeah, broken bones, uh, copped a horn through the leg. Um, a horn went up my Arsehole. Um, so that was pretty painful, man. That led for a week, so I can sympathise with women a little bit there. But, um, you know, again, that's just part and parcel of the deal. What's, eh? what's with getting hit in the crutch in rodeo? Because that many fellas have had that many bad injuries to, um, like, because I got stepped on, cut my arsehole in half through my gooch and down the yep. front of my leg, and had heaps of big shots to the grind area. Yep. I don't know why, but we seem yeah. to cop it around. I think from a bullfighting perspective, you're at that level, you know, your, your midsection's just at that right height where a bull will lift you. Mm. Um, from a rider's perspective, um, you get underneath them feet, man, it, anything can happen, you know. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, that's, again, just part and parcel of the game we play. That's all the people that don't know rodeo, they're like, oh... He's got big horns. I'm like, don't give a fuck about the horns. Yeah. It's the feet and it's going to hurt you. Yeah, 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 100%, mate. Um, and the only time I've been proper hooked was uh, a muley. Yeah. Because you just stay underneath them like yeah. that. I'd rather yeah. the big bats, they pick you up. And, and it's funny you say that about muleys and, and a few of the old listeners and, and um, people, followers will probably understand this, but uh, back in the day, you know, uh, Johnson's brothers from Boona would turn up and, you know, you could see the horns sticking out of the, the crate. <laughs> out of the crate. Yeah, you know, but, and if there was a muley in there, well, you knew it was a pretty bad muley. You know? <laughs> like, if it didn't have a set of racks, there was a reason it was on the truck. And, you know, Macca was the same. Macca had a few muleys and, you know, everyone sort of back Cream puff was probably yeah. the standout, yeah. was it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, you know, there was another little black muley... Um, Gills had BJ as well. That's going right back. But, you know, uh, it was sort of a... Uh, I suppose it's an aesthetic look for the horns from, yeah. from a lot of perspective is, you know, they're big, bad-looking fellas. Yeah. But, yeah, some of them muleys used to buck too. Yeah. You know, like if... Especially, you know, like no standings of mackers, you know, like he was a grouse little bull. So, you know, they all had them and, yeah... I'm pretty partial to the muleys. I, I carded a few myself, so <laughs> the horns sort of didn't really bother make you them. too much. Yeah, yeah, well, they don't make them buck. Yeah. You know, um, they look the part, but mm. doesn't make them buck. <laughs> what were some of your standout bulls that you had, or just favourites? Um, 
me myself personally, like Cart and a few, um, had a little bull that was uh, bred by a mate of mine. Um, end up calling him Mavericks Quicksilver because I was sponsored by yeah, Mavericks cool. Western Wear at the time. Um, he was a cool little bull. Um, he wasn't that little. He grew into a pretty big bull. But um, yeah, I mean, just over the years, there's every contractor's had you know grouse bulls. Um, you know, brother of Macca's was a cool little bull. Um, you know, Johnson's had Cotton Eye Joe, and and you know, then you go into the likes of the Gills, and you know, um, the Happy, you know, with Insanity and Pulp Fiction and Freckles Brown. And, yeah, that that crew that he had back then was rank. Oh, right? rank, yeah, mate. You know, Slashinger was another good little bull. Um, lots of good bulls over the years, and. And you know, lots of rank bull rides on them bulls too. You know, because there was it was a era where there was just that cowboys many, just as good as them. Yeah, mate. There was just that many good cowboys. You know, one standout for me was probably um, Scotty Fraser rode Insanity down at Tamworth. Um, you know, rank man, um, rank bull, and <laughs> ended up being a rank bull ride. You know, so. Um, when the worlds collide. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, when, when they all come together. But that was a part of that era too where we sort of, you know, brought all the best mm. bulls we could gather and and then all the best bull riders were mm. there, you know. Um, so, you know, it was just one of them eras of bull riding mm. where you just seen rank bull ride after rank bull ride. So did you end up picking up a few bullfighting titles? Uh, yeah, mate, uh, won a few, a um, few amateur circuit titles, I think four of them, a few Australian titles, um, you know, for us fellas as bullfighters, it's, it's you know, that year in buckles, you, you travel pretty hard and take a lot of hits and hookings to, to win a buckle, <laughs> um, you know, they don't give them away at every event just for winning a, a yeah. bull ride. Um, I was fortunate that w at the time... Uh, we started some freestyle competitions over here when they were still allowed and um, we had a little series of them going, so that was pretty cool. Um, so that was, you know, just another part of, uh, you know, bullfighting that you just don't see now. Mm. Um, you know, you see it in the States still, obviously. Yeah, with, I went to an with event. With the BFO and all yeah. those ones. So, But here was good, um, you know, throughout that period where, you know, we could actually you know, bring a carload of bullfighters, you know, a few of us <laughs> used to travel together and turn up and do the rodeo or whatever it was and then, then do the freestyle comp. I tell you what, you won't find a wild, wilder bunch of fellas than them BFO guys. Yeah, right. Holy. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. went and watched it um, in the States and it wasn't the BFO, it was another spin-off of it and they yeah. did more different games and played it in teams oh yeah and they had a last man standing so everyone had the circle they had to stay in yeah yeah and they had this spanish fighting cow and just hot has yeah just come in and it smoked everyone i was and, it, and that's the it was thing, so yeah. exciting I mean, they've bred them bulls over there <laughs> mm. they're mexican and and you know them spanish fighting bulls that's mm. that's what they're bred to do <laughs> and you know well, um we had bulls here uh you know i'd, I'd probably rate just as quick, Speedy. Mm -hmm. um, Macca had one called Speedy Man, and that was his name for a reason. <laughs> um, you quick know, and mean. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and it, like I said, a lot of them bulls back in that era were um, a PS or clean skin, so, you know, they flattened out and come pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, 90% of them. It wasn't like, you know. And they knew what they wanted to do, yeah, too. Yeah, they wanted to <laughs> eat the out the, 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 the arse end, you know, so. Um, but, you know, anyone that, uh, you know, has fought bulls when you, you know, you can work them bulls because you know they're going to follow you or, mm. or you know, they know that, you, that they're fair dinkum. They're mm. going to come hard and fast and, you know, you just got to make sure you throw your fake right and get around <laughs> them, you know. Ozcan Rural, providing southwest Victoria with everything related custom sheep and cattle yards. Get in touch with the fellas via email auscanrule at gmail.com. That's A-U-S, can like the one you drink, rural at gmail.com. Building fences straighter than your local politician. Do you find uh, when you're bullfighting, some of them older season bulls that probably weren't as hot, 
were harder to fight because they'd lock in on them guys. Yeah, like, yeah. You get them fizzy bulls that they just want to kill anything as yep. soon as they see something there. Yeah. They're wanting to go, but... Yeah, especially with the, the PS brand bulls back in the era, like, they're pretty high-strung. Mm. Um, so, you know, but, yeah, certainly some of them older bulls got coming mm. towards the end, you know, like, they got a brain of their own as well, <laughs> yeah. so they know what the deal is, but... Because you see some of them bulls, the bullfighter picks it up perfect, but... He just ignores it. Yeah. Like he knows where he's going and, yeah. and what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's. I've, over the years, I've had a few sort of fellows and done a few schools and had a few. Stu it's something, you know, you can't be everywhere all the time um, with the sport, you know, so especially fighting bulls. I mean, if, if you make a good pass and that bull doesn't hook up with you. Um, you know, you just hope that your partner is there to <laughs> pick him up on the back end, um, you know, and, and you know, a team of bullfighters is far better than one individual <laughs> standout, um, you know, from, from a safety perspective for <laughs> them bull riders, you know, and fortunate enough to work with some good, really good fellas <laughs> over the years, you know, um, Tekka Wilson, uh, you know, Mark Donnellan, David Back, you know, Follows it, and you just gel with them. Mm. There's some blokes you gel with, and and then you just make each other look good. Yeah, you know, um, and and that just comes from time working mm. together with fellas. So you get to read each other. Mm. So what are your thoughts on the sport, the way it's going at the moment? You happy with the direction we're going? And yeah, all look, it's um, yeah, hundred percent, mate. It's um. It's professionalised across the board, um, especially with the likes of these junior development programs. Um, the only thing I'd say is we're seeing a lot more kids sort of go to the States and get approached earlier mm. than, um, than what used to happen. Um, so, you know, we're seeing a lot of the better young bull riders sort of head off and and further their career in the States, which, you know, you certainly can't blame them. That's mm -hmm. the pinnacle of the sport over there. Um, you know, you've only got to look at young Kai Hamilton, you know, he won 700,000. Yeah. You know, that's phenomenal. You're never, yeah. never going to make that <laughs> over here in, in, in your whole career, mm. you know. So, um, and then, you know, like I said, the breeding programs with, uh, you know, these dummy events and then through to your ridden classic events and... So everything's sort of on the rise. Um, it'd be great to see a little bit more uh, television over here, mm. I suppose, to get that exposure, which in turn will bring sponsorship and, and, and raise the money. That's um, what I thought was disappointing when we had an Australian Kai Hamilton win uh, a world title first time in the PRCA that yeah. an Australian had done it. And one media like news thing did a story on it. Yeah. Like it should have like, blown it up everywhere, everywhere. and it, it would yep. have been so great for our sport so yep. so many kids doesn't matter where you grow up if if you decide that's what you want to be you can be it yeah so if they blew it up a bit more it could have really helped kids and because once you have a countryman do it you know that it's possible yeah it's um it's unfortunate but uh i i suppose that's just how it is here in australia we're not a mainstream sport mm. um and, you know, A, we don't have that constant television exposure for people to understand the sport. So, I mean, people in city still think that, you know, we tie that flank rope around, around their, their testicles, nuts, yeah. You know, mm. so, I mean, that, you know, in itself is we've just got to educate the public that, mm. you know, it is what it is. Um, I think in the States, because it's just a part of their culture mm. um, and, you know, they grow up. You know, a bank manager can be walking down the street with a cowboy hat on. Yeah. You know, um, so and and obviously population per capita mm. in the states is. Yeah. Well, know, we got twenty seven million there. They got three hundred and thirty million. Yeah. So There's you know, the sport's in Texas huge. Than yeah. There is yeah. in all of Australia. Australia. Mm. Yeah. So you know, um, but as far as the sport here goes, I think as long as you know we just keep chipping away, and um, you know, as long as the sport stays at a professional level and, and, you know, like I said, the stock's going to get better. You know, we've just got to educate these young kids and cowboys, which I think, you know, the whole mini bull riding thing, I wasn't really fond of it at the start. Um, but, you know, now I sort of see the progression and helping them kids transition into junior bulls and, 
and you know it, it's building uh, confidence in them and mm. and you know and there's a wedge of them mm. you know anywhere you go now there's just the biggest wedge of kids yeah. getting around on mm. these mini bulls so um, you know that that's just going to take time for that generations to mm. come through and then and then we'll you know we'll see the numbers I think of of bull riders back to where you know it's viable to be putting mm. on big big productions because mm. it's a great that like the junior academy and the stuff that the PBR are doing yeah putting getting them kids used to the sort of big stage that opportunity is crazy like normally you got to be well into your career and very invested yeah. before you even start to think about especially the state of origin putting them kids under the <laughs> limelight and giving them a little bit of taste of you know and riding Sold out of yeah, and, yeah, yeah and riding for your state that whole you know queensland new south mm. wales thing that we got going <laughs> on so you know and and i suppose just get them used to that profile of you know um those big productions where you know there's cameras and they're indoors and the mm. lights and and um, so then it just becomes second nature to them, you know. They're not overawed by it, and and you know, um, nerves and and that is always going to play a part in it, you know. People used to say, well, you know, you, you're fearless and what, but I'd still get nerves before every show, mm. um, you know. That's just human nature. Yeah, and know? a lot of people confuse nerves with fear. Yeah, that's not fear. Like, you always get nervous, but it, I think it's actually. A oh good no! Thing I, shoot it myself, I shoot myself. Oh, I shoot yourself too. Yeah. Sometimes I did then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a bull actually, uh, Charters Towers skunk of gills, get a horn up under the uh, vest, and his horn was poking up under my chin here, and I done two laps of the arena, I h- h- hung up on his horns before oh. I, and the only reason I got off is he sort of tried to plant me in the dirt and and. And I just sort of scurried off it, and, and yeah, I need to shoot myself. Like, <laughs> you know, that, that's that's fun. That was the fun part of it, you know. Um, there's just things like that you remember that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> most people would probably go, "You're crazy," but yeah, you know. Uh, I suppose you have got to be a little bit. Mm. Um, and you know, growing up in a country background I suppose and, and growing up around cattle not that I really did until I was about sort of 14, 15 mm. but um, you know anyone that sort of worked the yards you know you, you get old Brahmin cows come in <laughs> and that sort of thing so most people can sort of have, get around them a little bit but yeah you know um, it's yeah it's just mate it's just the love of the sport I think if you're passionate about something mm. Um, you know, you'll take the ups and downs with mm. it, you know. And who was someone that sort of helped you out a lot with your bullfighting? That really got you going and... Mate, funny enough, yeah, it was just down at Campbell Frames. Mm. Like I said, I'd done my apprenticeship there. Um, Frame, he was sort of got me going. I really didn't do my first school until I'd sort of won a few amateur titles. And um, that was a Dennis Johnson school down at Boona. Um, you know, that was probably the only school I really did. Um, just watched a lot of videos, mm. man, you know, like um, Blake's from the States, um, you know, and, and yeah, same deal. If you want it bad enough, you'll go out and try and put it into practice. Mm. So, you know, it was, um, that was, yeah, probably the only sort of way really back then because there wasn't a lot of schools, people sort of doing that, you know. Dennis had just come home from the States um, and put on that school, you know, and there was the likes of Shane Mad Dog Simpson, Daryl Deefen back there, myself, you know. So when I sort of look back at it and think of the fellas that were there that actually went on with it um, and, you know, well, obviously Deefy just got inducted into the Hall of Fame, you know, so and everyone knows Mad Dog, so, um, you know, whereas now, and I've had the privilege of running a few schools, you know, you, you might get one sort of kid that really goes on with it um, and and chooses to make a career out of it, so, um, which is, you know, it'd be great to see more kids coming through that, that want to be a bullfighter, but, 
Speaking uh, of the schools, you've you have something in the sort of works. At yeah, the hopefully, mate. Uh, on the 29th of uh, 30th of November and the 1st of December, um, we've got Brady Fielder and hopefully Brady Olson. So the two Texas Rattlers coming over. Um, put on a school out here at Graysmere. Um, Mainly for the kids around here. Um, Brady's an ex and Brennan's boy, grew up around Rocky here, so, um, you know, it's just good to sort of give back to the local area and, and you know, um, he went through the same process that these kids are going through now. You know, St Brennan's is a good school that they have a rodeo school down there and, you know, cart the kids away to shows. So, um, you know, again, it's just trolling educate these kids and, and get them on the right path from the get-go, um, you know, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll go down that path and, you know, there'll be a bullfight in school as well, so, you know, hopefully we'll get a few young fellas that, that mm. actually want to fight bulls out of it. So if um, someone is interested in the school or getting in contact, where's where do they start? Um, mate, we'll punch it up in the next probably week or so. Um, we just had to finalise a few more things. Um, it'll just be on Facebook, mate, and, and you know, all your social media. Um, Youth of the Nation Rodeo Company is is the company that's sort of going to put it on. Um, I'm just giving them a hand to get it up and rolling. So, um, you know, uh, keep your ears out for that and, yeah. and we'll punch it up on Facebook. And, and they could contact you if... Yeah, by all any. means, man. Yeah. yeah, touch base, send me a DM, whatever mm. the case may be, if mm. they want to. I can certainly fill them in on the information. Um, you know, <coughs> pretty open to any young kid that mm. wants to, you know... And that's the thing with kids, you know, nowadays. Just don't be afraid to go up and ask your idol or mm. ask someone for advice or help because uh, most cowboys will do that. Yeah. You know, mm. if you show interest, they'll give you... Mm. All the time in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've got nothing to be afraid of. That's right. Mm. You know, so... Um, but, yeah, just DM us and, and um, you know, like I said, we'll punch it out on Facebook and all the outlets here shortly. And, and um, you know, again, it's just trying to get that next generation mm. going and show them a bit more professionalism mm. in the sport and, and uh, yeah. And... So what uh, what's next for Peter Blackall? Um, mate, I'm just back to breeding a few and, and carting a few um, little bulls to the uh, futurity events. Um, for me, that's where sort of I get my satisfaction now is just breeding a few and getting Having them going. Having a fiddle. <laughs> yeah, mate. Um, you know, that's... And, yeah, just helping kids. You know, there's as many kids as we can sort of get involved in sport and, and you know, get them up and going, even if they don't go on with it eventually. Um, they generally stick around. Yeah, you know, like give them the opportunity to sort of have a good go at it mm. and, you know, maybe learn some skills that, that'll help them mm. achieve what they want to achieve. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a great sport for kids because yes. it, it matures them, you've got to be responsible. Like it's yep. And I think it teaches them commitment, dedication, and determination. And, and that's not only in the sport, that'll carry through with mm. them in general life, life yeah. you know. Um, so you see them kids that are committed and, and are at a young age, you know, they'll probably end up being pretty successful in life down mm. the track. So, you know, it's... Um, if they don't take too many hookers. That's right. <laughs> yeah, if they don't take too many hookers, yeah. So, um, you know, but you, you, you know... That, again, that's part and parcel of it and, you know, we don't want to... Um, you want to sort of educate them right and, and then hopefully they won't take too many hookings, you know. Um, it's just when they end up in a bind that, you know, that, that's going to happen. So, but, you know, I don't think the bulls are quite as savage um, as what they used to be. Um, Do you think because, that's due to the ABBI and stuff like that? Yeah, they're I think handled it, a lot more. Yes, hundred percent, mate. Yep, yeah, the bulls are getting handled at a young age now. You know, they're not. Uh, again, like I said, you know, we used to go and catch cleanies, so they were feral cattle. That had, you know, <laughs> Never seen man before. Yeah, so well, that's all gone. Mm. So yeah, exactly that, mate. You know, they're getting handled. Um, you know, there's still bulls that'll run you over and give you a hook and. Mm. Um, just not a whole pen load, <laughs> yeah. so, um, but you know, 
the sport is the sport. It doesn't matter whether they're, you know, if you end up underneath them or in a bind mm. or hung up or, you know, it, it, it's still going to hurt. Mm. So, you know. So who was the main contractor you used to fight for? Um, oh, Campbell frame early in the piece. Um, when I moved up here to central Queensland was Lionel Simpson. Um, and then sort of from there is just following that sort of CBR, the, the sort of pro series. Um, so it was multiple contractors then. Sort of once you get to that point, it's sort of you're not really in with a contractor anymore. You're just contracted to do the rodeo and mm. two or three contractors turn up or whatever. So, But, yeah, pretty much sort of fought all the major contract bulls, you know, um, all the gills, you know, Malcolm and Eddie, Happy, um, Peter, you know, and then sort of you got the likes of Johnson's brothers back then, um, George Hempenstall, you know, um, a lot of old school contractors, but, you know, all had good bulls. Mm. So, um, you and know. And a lot of their blood still. Very predominant. Through, yeah. Very predominant mm. in a lot of the genetics you see mm. now. Um, you know, uh, well, I bought a cow off uh, George and she ended up being one of my best cows, mm. you know, so, um, and she's proper old school bloodlines of George's. But, you know, that's, that's again, it's just, um, you know, they're, they're the eras of contractors where they breed and, and, you know, they've got an avenue for them bulls when, as now, you know, you can still do that and have the avenue through these futurity mm. events. Um, you know, and the monetary levels increased too for these young bulls, you know, and we saw that pretty recently at Wallace's sale, you know, that young bull made 36000 Yeah, crazy. You know, so um, it's... You know, the, the good genetics are going to, mm. you know, be rewarded for that. And like right. you said, you can fast track it pretty quick. Yeah. Now. So Yeah, you don't have to put a lot of time in and, yep. and have some good barkers. Yeah. You've still got to put the effort in, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah as a you know, there's yeah. a lot of handling and mm. feeding. And we were talking about it earlier. You know, people just, till you start contracting bulls yourself, you just don't realise the effort that goes mm. into you know, putting a pen on the road and mm. carting them down the road and looking after them and having them looking good and, mm. you know, hopefully bucking good, so... Um, Every fella that's come and give me a hand that rides and that and but doesn't have bulls, they're like, holy fuck, I think everyone that rides needs to come yeah. and fiddle with them and realise yeah. the amount of work. Yeah. And that's changed a little bit mm. um, too, you know, like early in, in that... Um, my era, I'll, I'll say... Um, you know, a lot of fellas sort of travelled with contractors, you know, like you, you sort of done done the circuit with them and, and you know, that turned them into cowboys and, um, you know, good, bad or indifferent. But, um, you know, now that doesn't happen. Um, you know, there's not too many blokes that are <coughs> going down the road with contractors. So they probably don't see that element too much, you know and understand what goes into it. Like you said, they certainly probably appreciate it, but just actually seeing it firsthand mm. of, of what goes into actually getting a bull and, and good enough to put on a truck mm. and take to a show. Mm. So. I think that's where the satisfaction goes from the amount of work. And then once they're doing good, it's, you know what it takes to get them there. Yeah. Like, there's it, hundreds of hours of yeah. like, Getting them used to running through yards and just Everything. being responsible and yeah. and finding the outgate and leaving and yeah. there's, there's a lot more work than just putting a bull in a chute and throwing yeah. someone on him. On him, that's right. Like yeah. the, the days of doing that are long gone. Like and everything's really well handled and yeah. responsible. And you know we're we're still going through it like I've been through it where you know there's no guarantee. Mm. You know, you can breed your best cow to your best bull and there's still no guarantee that calf's going to bite. <laughs> yeah, um, just heightens your chances. Yes, mm. and, you know, so with like we're saying, with the genetics, I think that's going to sort of come through a lot more mm. and, and um, you know, hopefully raise not only that, the sort of monetary level of these little bulls, which we're starting to see now. Mm. So looking back over your career, what's something you're most proud of? Or even your life? Um... 
probably within the career was actually uh, getting a son going, fighting bulls, um, and fighting bulls with him. Mm. Actually being in the pen with him and fight, cool. fighting bulls with him. And uh, got a pretty cool photo at home with the pair of us there. So um, that's probably one of my proudest moments um, in the sport. You know, other than that, mate, uh, I just try and live life. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we all have our ups and downs, yeah. and just and try to be the best you yeah, can be. Yep. You yeah. know, and you only get out of life what you put into it. Mm. Same with this sport. Mm. You'll only get out of it what you put into it. Mm. So if you want to put the hard yards in, mm. you'll get something out of it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Peter Blackall. It's been Appreciate an absolute it. pleasure, and uh, I'll see you down the road. Will do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.